start again. Uh, thank you very much for having me here, and thank you very much for the support which the division has been able to, uh, to give me to come. Uh, what I would like to talk to you about a little bit today is some work that we've done over the last six months concerning the mechanism of the uh, oxidative coupling reaction. And I'd like to start <coughs> by showing you some of the things which I think we have to understand if we're really going to develop this process into a money-making proposition. And this is really very much from the basic chemistry point of view because I believe without this basic understanding that we won't be able to develop a better and more effective catalyst. And the things that we would really like to know something about is how and if the methane and oxygen are absorbed on the working catalyst surface. Unless we have some kind of absorption of either reactant, we're really not dealing with a catalyst system at all. I think it's pretty well established from Professor Lunsford's work over the last few years or so that the reaction probably proceeds via the formation of methyl radicals. And we would really like to have a more detailed understanding of the precise chemical events which take place in the formation of these reactions. The other question that I'll be addressing this particularly today is what is the precise role of the oxygen? And particularly, what is the role of the lattice gas phase oxygen exchange reaction. It's been known for at least 20 years that at temperatures at which the partial oxidation reaction occurs, say 700 degrees centigrade, nearly all lattice oxygen in oxide surfaces exchange extremely rapidly with the gas phase. And this exchange generally hasn't been considered in the discussions of the mechanisms of this reaction. The all-important question from a commercial point of view is what, what chemical factors really control the C2 selectivity? And finally, and there's been some fairly heated discussion about this over the last few months, how do products, so particularly the CO and also the ethane and ethylene, react on the catalyst surface, and indeed do they react further on the catalyst surface? So these are some of the questions that I would like to address in this talk. Now, I know some of you are probably anxious to, to go home and recover from almost a week of partial oxidation, so I'm going to tell you the results of our study <laughs> right now. <laughs> what we've basically found is that methane is strongly absorbed on the catalyst surface, but oxygen not. We've also found that the absorbed methane does not directly participate in the formation of the uh, reaction products. We found that oxygen, as expected, exchanges very rapidly with the catalyst lattice oxygen, and this exchange is essential for the catalyzed reaction. We found that the products ethane and ethylene are rapidly oxidized but not by molecular oxygen and not by the O minus ions, which are probably involved in the formation of the metal radicals. And finally, we believe that metal radicals are formed on O minus ions. And I see Professor Lundford in the audience, so I'm going to make a confession. Because when we started off this work, I decided that the mechanism that Professor Lundford had postulated was wrong, basically, on what profound ignorance. And I now confess that I've returned to orthodoxy and that nearly all of the results that we obtained from our study are, in fact, nicely consistent uh, with his original proposal. The apparatus that we use for our study is the isotope transmit method. This is nothing new. It's been around for quite a long time. And what it involves is passing your reactants over a small catalyst bed and having a mass spectrometer uh, sensor right at the bottom of the bed. And what you do is the following. You set up your reaction, for example, between methane and oxygen under normal conditions. And when your catalyst is nicely equilibrated, you might change the methane to deuterated methane and follow the appearance of the labeled products or the labeled methane 
are immediately after your capital spend. And the big advantage of this kind of system is that you do not <coughs> disturb the working capitalist in any way. Now, the way that we do it, rather than doing a complete switch from one isotope to the other, which is the common way of doing it, we in fact inject a small pulse, usually about 10 to 30 second length, onto the system. Now, we do that because the reagents that we use, the labelled reagents, are very expensive. We do the uh, pulsing using valve valves, which I guess some of you are familiar with, but in case you're not, in the load situation, your reagent is flowing along the blue line here while you're loading your loop with your isotopic species. Now you can load the loop at a very low flow rate so that uh, you save a lot of material. In the inject mode, your reagent is flowing through the loop and basically pushes the plug of the isotopically labelled material into your gas stream. Now I emphasise again, the major advantage of this is that you can use it on a working catalyst without disturbing the system. Now one of the things that you have to be able to do is to have a very sharp pulse. And I show you here uh, a switch, as we call it, uh, from oxygen to argon. At this point, we throw a switch, so we inject the pulse of argon onto the catalyst bed, and you can see the mass 40 peak of the argon ion rises from basically its background level to its equilibrium value in about 0.2 of a second. So we have a very nice, very sharp pulse. Now again, the, the advantages of the system, it allows the study of the working catalyst, and apart from some minor isotope effects, the system is really not perturbed in any way. And finally, and this is very important for the partial oxidation reaction, you can use it at high temperatures. One of the real problems in applying modern analytical techniques such as IR to the partial oxidation reaction is that it occurs at such high temperatures and it makes life very difficult from the experimental point of view. Now I tell you there's a major disadvantage to this, that if you do these kind of experiments it will make you very poor and the supply of the labelled material very rich in a very short time. <laughs> it leads to very expensive. The conditions of the experiments that I'm going to tell you about today involve samarium oxide catalysts uh, temperatures of about 700 degrees centigrade and very high space velocities of about 80 mil per second per gram of catalyst, which translates into a normal uh, space velocity of about half a million. And we do that to eliminate all possibilities of homogeneous gas phase reactions. I might add that quite fortuitously, our choice of the samarium oxide turned out to be uh, almost inspired because it is one of the very few catalysts which does not form a carbonate surface when it's working. And the presence of the carbonate greatly complicates the interpretation of the oxygen tracer experiments in particular because the oxygen gets incorporated into the carbonate layer. But that was purely a fortuitous choice. Okay, let's see what happens when we do the simplest of all experiments. We have a working catalyst, we have methane and oxygen that are flowing over it, we have steady conditions, and at this point here, we switch from normal methane to deuterated methane, and we're sitting on peak M over E20, which is the deuterated uh, methane. We see the sudden rise in the iron current of peak 20, this is our pulse length here, which I guess is about 14 seconds in this case. And at this point here, we switch back to the normal isotope. And our mass 20 peak drops as we flush out the gas phase in our reactor. And then we see a long tail as the deuterated methane is flushed off the catalyst surface. And the area under this curve here compared to the area of our pulse 
gives us a direct measure of the amount of methane which is absorbed on the catalyst surface at 700 degrees centigrade. Now these are some of the values that you get. On samarium oxide, about 6 times 10 to the 20 molecules per gram of catalyst are absorbed. This is with a working catalyst where we have both methane and oxygen present, so we also have water and carbon dioxide being formed. I may add that in these experiments we have a dry ice trap between the mass spectrometer and the catalyst bed. Over just straight samarium oxide without any oxygen present, in other words not a working catalyst, we see a slight reduction in the amount of methane which is absorbed. Now, these numbers are probably accurate to within a factor of two. So don't take these differences too seriously. If, again, samarium oxide, but this time a working catalyst using carbon-13 labeled methane as our tracer, we get the same answer, uh, six times 10 to the 20 molecules. If we dope our samarium oxide catalyst with lithium, Again, we get about 10 to the 20th, 4 times 10 to the 20th molecules of methane absorbed. And finally, on praseodymium, which is basically a strong oxidizing catalyst, again, we see the same sort of thing. Now, to us, it was quite extraordinary uh, that an inert molecule like methane should be absorbed on an inert oxide at such high temperatures. And we, in fact, published our work with considerable trepidation uh, but uh, I believe that uh, Dr. Cameron, who is here at this meeting, has in fact seen almost identical results as far as he told me. And another group in Sydney has since also found that methane is absorbed on these oxides at high temperatures using a completely different technique. So I think we have to take it pretty well as acceptable, as established, that methane is in fact absorbed on these oxides at reaction temperature. Just to show you the desorption kinetics of the methane, I'm plotting here these data as a first order equation against time. You can see that the samarium and the lithium samarium have similar desorption rates, praseodymium somewhat longer. The curves are near enough to being first order, at least to a first approximation. And I draw your attention to the time scale here. You're looking at half times for desorption of the order of 30 seconds for the samarium and the lithium samarium. The mechanism of methane absorption, I would suggest to you the following. Uh, similar types of uh, reactions have been suggested on numerous occasions in relation to the exchange reactions of methane over things like magnesium oxide. And this work was done way back in the early 60s and 50s. Uh, we're basically saying that the methane is sitting on a highly basic oxide in a partially dissociated form, the CH3 group carrying a partial negative charge, the hydrogen acting as a, having a partial positive charge. Okay. What I'm going to do now is start looking at the appearance of the isotope label in the products. And I start off by showing you uh, the deuterated ethanes. Now, I'm sure you'll appreciate there are some limitations in the mass spectrometry technique. You can't use it to measure all of the product because of the appearance of the uh, fragmentation patterns, but the CD, C2D6 is a particularly easy and unequivocal example. And what you see here is something very interesting, because the transient for the appearance of the deuterated product is quite different for the transient of the absorbed methane. You can see that when you switch the CD4 on, it rises, the appearance of the product rises instantly continues for the duration of the pulse and then drops instantly. There is no indication of the long trailing part 
which we saw for the desorption of methane. And this is a very important result because it seems to indicate to us that the CD6 or the C2D6 does not reflect the isotopic composition of the material which is sitting on the catalyst surface. What it does do is instantly reflect the isotopic composition of the reactants in the gas phase. And I'll come back to that point again a little later. So our conclusion from this work is that the C2H6 is not directly formed from the absorbed methane. Let me turn now to the oxygen. In this case, we're doing exactly the same thing, except now we're leaving our methane in the CH4 form and we're switching our oxygen from O16 to O18. And in this case here, we're doing this in the absence of methane. All we're doing is we just replace the methane flow by a helium flow and we're just pulsing our catalyst with O18. And we're looking at the appearance of MO36, which is O18, and ME34, which is O16, O18. And you can see that there is a strong exchange between the gas phase oxygen and the lattice oxygen of the catalyst. Again, if we integrate under these curves here and compare that integral with the pulse, we can easily determine how much oxygen is exchanged. And it turns out that during the 14 second O18 pulse, 20% of all the oxygen atoms in the catalyst oxide ladder were exchanged. Now we've since done this work where we've done complete oxygen switches and you can exchange 100% of your samarium oxide oxygen atom in about 60 seconds. Now this work is completely consistent with some work which was reported by Winter in the Journal of the Chemical Society way back in 1968. And you can take his, he, he virtually did oxygen exchange of the periodic table oxides. Um, and it turns out that all of them exchange very rapidly, some as low as 200 degrees centigrade, and certainly by the time you get to 6 and 700 degrees centigrade, they exchange very rapidly. These are some first order exchange rates which are extrapolated from his data. Now these values are probably not more accurate than an order of magnitude because I'm extrapolating from about 300 degrees centigrade right up to 700 degrees centigrade from his Arrhenius data. But for samarium oxide, 6 times 10 to the 18th molecules per second per gram, europium, 10 to the 19th, magnesium oxide, 10 to the 19th, strontium oxide 10 to the 18. And we can compare that with a net methane conversion rate of about 10 to the 20th molecules per second per gram on our samarium oxide catalyst. So the oxygen exchange rate of the catalyst and the methane decomposition rate are at least of the same order of magnitude. When I read Winter's papers, I started to believe in Professor Lund's models again. Because what Winter claimed, and I think very convincingly, is that the exchange, the, op, the lattice exchange reactions went something like this. That the gas phase oxygen sat on the catalyst surface and interacted with what he called the pair of anion vacancy to form the O minus ion. And the O minus ion then exchanged with the lattice oxygen sitting in the bulk material. And he suggested that the rate determining step was the desorption of molecular oxygen from the catalyst surface. And what this really is, it's just a nice convenient way of forming the O minus ion in the catalytic system and thereby establishing a catalytic cycle. And I'll come back to this question again a little later on. And we also did O18 traces in a reacting system, in other words, in the presence of methane. And as expected, the O18 appears in the carbon dioxide products, both in the doubly labelled carbon dioxide and in the CO18O16, as expected. There's really nothing very surprising. 
But what did surprise us a little bit was when we traced the carbon-13 in the methane to the carbon dioxide. And in that case, we did C13 methane switches on the working catalyst, and we looked at M over E17, which is the carbon-13 methane, the M over E49. I might add, to do these experiments, you have to use O18 as your oxidant, because at M over E44, which you would normally use to detect CF2, you have a strong interference with propane, which is a co-product of the oxidative coupling reaction. So to shift the molecular weight of the CF2 to a region where we get away from this interference, we use O18. So this is the C13 CO2O18, and this is the C13 ethane. And the thing which is very clear is that the carbon tracing to the CO2 does not trail the same way that the oxygen trace to the CO2 does. So in other words, what is happening is that whereas the oxygen reactor is entering the oxygen pool on the catalyst, the methane is not entering the methane pool which is absorbed on the catalyst on its way to becoming CO2. All right. but I'm coming back now to the question of the relationship between part of the rate of the partial oxidation reaction and the rate of the exchange reaction. And we used two catalysts which we found quite interesting. Samarium and lithium doped samarium and the concentration of lithium on our catalyst is about 3%. In the case of samarium, lithium is a very effective catalyst poison. And you can see that when we add the lithium, the net methane conversion rate drops by about an order of magnitude. And I think Professor Ross has seen something similar here. But what is interesting is when you look at the amount of O18, which is exchanged during a 14 second pulse, that also drops by an order of magnitude. So we see a direct correlation between the rate of the oxygen exchange and the rate of the partial oxidation reaction. And the other difference between these two catalysts is that carbonate is absolutely not present on the samarium oxide whereas the lithium doped catalyst is completely covered in carbonate. The other question that intrigued us was the level of oxygen absorption on the catalyst. Now because of the rapid oxygen exchange reaction between the gas phase and the lattice oxygen, you couldn't use this technique to measure the uptake of oxygen in an absorbed form by the catalyst just get swamped out. So we attempted to measure this by doing an argon oxygen switch. And the result of that experiment was that we could not detect any oxygen absorption on the catalyst surface. And that doesn't mean it's not there, it just means that it is below the level that we could detect. I would now like to just come back for a moment to this overhead here. In this particular experiment, as the isotope pulse traveled through our system, there was a slight mixing of the two isotopic forms at the trailing end of the pulse. And if we looked at our data very carefully, then between the end of the pulse up here and this time down here, we were able to obtain 12 data points in which the isotopic composition of the methane vary from essentially 100% C13 to 0% C13. And over the same time period, we were able to measure the isotopic composition of the carbon dioxide and of the ethane. So these are 12 data points over 1.9 seconds. And I'll plot here the C13 fraction in the methane against the C13 fraction in the products plotted directly against the carbon-13 
from the CO2 and against the square root of the C13 in the ethane. And you can see there's a perfect correlation. And what that again means is that the isotopic composition of the gas phase and the products are instantly equilibrated, even though you have a big pool of methane of a quite different isotopic composition sitting on your catalyst surface. Okay. I now want to change topic completely. Well, not completely, but I'm changing gear. So just sit down, clear your minds, and think about the fate of the C2H6 and the C2H4 products. And the way that we looked at this was as follows. We put in an extra loop. In fact, our apparatus looks nothing like that. We have 10 Valco valves uh, where we can switch things all over the place. But conceptually, we had three loops. Uh, we could switch the methane, we could switch the oxygen, and we introduced a small amount of ethane, which we could switch to C13 ethane, or use ethylene and switch to C13 ethylene. We used, again, oxygen to move the CO2 molecular weight to 48, and we pulsed, in the example that I'm going to show you, C2H6. I might add that the amount of C2H6 that we added was such that we ended up with a final concentration of about 5% in the reactor. And this is an example of what you see when you sit on mass 48-49, which is CO2 labelled up with O18 and the C13, CO2. At this point here, we switch our ethane from normal ethane to C13 ethane and we see an immediate drop in mass 48 and an immediate rise in mass 49. Because these, this is now a linear scale here because these peaks are approximately the same height. In this particular case, approximately 50% of all the CO2 that was formed in the system came from the added ethane. Very clear-cut experiment. If we look uh, at the percentages of the CO2 which is coming from either ethane or ethylene at 700 or 850 degrees centigrade, three different catalysts, if I could just take you through the first one. The samarium oxide at 700, and about 50% of your CO2 is coming from ethane. At 850, it's nearly the same. If we add ethylene instead of ethane, 70% of your CO2 is coming from the ethylene at 700 degrees, nearly 80% at 850. If we dope our catalyst with lithium, we see a marked reduction in the amount of the CO2 which is coming from the additive. Now, I'm sure uh, you'll appreciate the significance of that result. For the phrasodinium, which is basically an oxidation catalyst that looks much the same as the samarium oxide. So there's no question that the products of the partial oxidation reaction are readily converted into CO2. I would like, like to go through some other data with you, which is a little hard to grasp, so I'll take it fairly slowly. We hooked up a mass spectrometer to the end of our system so that we could do full product analysis of, our, of the airflow. And I'd like you to focus firstly on the samarium oxide catalyst at 700 degrees centigrade. Now here, we first drain the system with the addition of a little bit of helium. And then we ran it, then we took the helium away and added an equivalent amount of ethane so that we have this, try and keep the system as constant as possible. In the helium case, when we look at the net methane conversion rate, it was 265 millimoles. Uh, when we add 5% ethane, the net methane conversion drops 
when you it's that it's, it's as that methane and ethane are in competition with each other. When we look at the oxygen conversion rates, these are the same. Even though your methane conversion drops, your oxygen conversion doesn't change. Nor does your net oxygen consumption, 75, 74, which means that we have excess oxygen in our reacting system. We are not operating under oxygen limiting conditions. But look what happens to the CO2 formation rate. It is also constant. This is an extraordinary result because despite the fact that the CO2 formation rate remains constant, you remember that 48% of all of the CO2 is coming from the added ether. Now we have repeated this work with several other catalysts at several different temperatures and at several different levels of oxygen consumption and you see the same result each time. And we believe it to be a fairly characteristic feature of the partial oxidation reaction. And the conclusions from this work are that the formation of the carbon oxide, and particularly carbon dioxide, is limited by the availability of the oxidant and not the reductant. And as the effect is found in the presence of excess oxygen, molecular oxygen is not the oxidant. Now, the explanation which we propose for this goes something like that. But this is a conceptual explanation that may not be the correct one in terms of molecules, but the correct one has to be, we think, something like this. That what happens is that you have oxygen in the gas phase, which is on, absorbed on the surface, and the oxygen concentration on the surface we believe to be very small. And we believe it has to be very small if you want to make any C2 products. Some of this oxygen on the surface forms an intermediate A, which I'll tell you later on, I think, is the O minus I. And this O minus reacts with hydrocarbons. And the hydrocarbons can be methane, ethane, or ethylene to form radicals and perhaps an OH minus. These radicals dimerize to give you your product. But there is also another intermediate, B, which is formed slowly from the oxygen on the surface, but which reacts very rapidly with the radicals which are formed down here. So that, to give you your carbon oxides. Now what this means is that the carbon oxides are limited by the availability of this B. The moment that the B is formed, the radical grabs it. And we believe that this sort of scheme explains most of the results that, we, that I showed you just a little bit earlier. I would like to conclude by just attempting to provide, give you a model of the way that we see it. How am I going for time? You have a couple minutes. Now we see the mechanism of the formation. The dilemma in the explanation is that the catalyst is covered with absorbed methane, which desorbs very slowly. But that the isotopic composition of the reactants is instantly reflected in the products. And the answer, <coughs> as we see it, there are two possibilities. And I'll start with the bottom one first. And that's the interface chemistry, as I call it. Sylvia Sayer gave us a nice talk about how methane absorb on nickel surfaces. And we played around quite a long time trying to adapt her ideas of the methane hitting a catalyst surface which is covered in absorbed methanes and giving you methyl radicals straight into the gas phase. But I believe that that's not really the explanation. But what I do think is might be the explanation is that we have a small number of very active sites in the catalyst at which the methane is not strongly absorbed but with which all the action takes place. So what you have is a catalyst surface which is covered in methane and there are a few sites 
where the product formation occurs. So that the moment that the isotopic composition in your gas phase changes, the products reflect that change. The Hunter and Anderson, I guess, just a little while ago, had a paper in JSCS where they showed that the abstraction of hydrogen by O minus was much more favoured than by O2 minus. And there is a large body of additional evidence that O minus is a very reactive species towards the action, towards alkanes. And the O minus can easily form in your catalyst lattice via this exchange reaction. So why not take the simplest explanation? Mahandra also showed, and this is really quite surprising, that the favourite transition state was a linear one, like this, where this is the O minus sitting on the catalyst surface, rather than the bridging one, like this. Now, if this is true, if this is the transition state, it provides a very nice way of putting your metal radicals into the gas phase because all you do is you break that bond and the metal radical is never even sitting on the catalyst surface. It goes straight into the gas phase. And that is also consistent with this work that Professor Lunsford has done some time ago where he shows quite convincingly that at least 60% of the C2 products are formed in the gas phase. So the sort of mechanism that I would like to propose to you is something like this. We have oxygen in the gas phase in equilibrium with a small amount on the surface. The surface oxygen reacts with an anion vacancy to form the O minus ion. The O minus reacts with the alkanes in a linear transition state like so. This bond breaks, the radical is released into the gas phase, OH minus is formed concomitantly, the OH minus disproportionates back into O minus and into your vacancy and water. This mechanism is basically what Professor Lundford suggested some years ago. The only difference is that the exchange mechanism provides a convenient way of forming your O minus. Thank you. We're running a little behind schedule, so we'll have one question. Jay? Um, since you introduced the practice of confessing heresy and then recanting it, I'll do the same. When I first saw your result about the strongly absorbed methane, I didn't believe it. I'm not. Neither did I. But I would like to suggest as a possibility that this is not normal absorption in the usual sense we take it. Um, I did some calculations when you got the paper, and it was my impression that the amount of absorbed methane is considerably more than monoair. And um, maybe, as after I heard what Charlie had to say too, I don't pretend to understand what it might be, but maybe this is something like absorption rather than adsorption. In my very and one experiment I might suggest to test, which you obviously at some expense are set up to do, is to look at the similar behavior of ethane. If it's really surface absorption, I would expect that thing to be somewhat more strongly absorbed. If it's bulk absorption, then perhaps less so. That might be a test. Yes, I agree. Thank you, sir. Our behold, Jay Van Holman and Jay Ross. The paper will be presented by Professor Ross.